Three years ago, when the United Conservative Party government of Alberta decided to cut the corporate income tax from 12% to 8%, uh, Energy Media took the editorial stance that that was a really bad idea. And the reason because of that, it was sold as a job creation move. And the problem within the oil and gas industry, of course, is that it's shed almost 40,000 jobs since the peak employment in 20, late 2013. And with the digital technology the industry is adopting, those job losses are going to continue. In fact, there's a, an Ernst & Young study that shows Alberta could lose as many as 30 or 40,000 jobs by 2040. So cutting taxes to create jobs while the industry is shedding jobs is generally not a good strategy. That was our argument. And now there's a study out from Parkland Institute that pretty much confirms that we took the right stance and the government apparently did not. So I'm going to talk to Ian Hussey, who is an economist with Parkland and author of Job Creation or Job Loss, Big Companies Use Tax Cut to Automate, um, automate Away Jobs in the Oil Sands. Welcome to the interview, Ian. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. Like, you know, I'm really glad you're here. This is this has been dormant now for a couple of years. It hasn't attracted a lot of attention. But in 2019, I interviewed economists, you know, at the University of Calgary, who were absolutely adamant that theory says that you that corporate taxes are the worst way to tax uh, uh, tax corporations. It should be other forms of taxation and that this was a really good move and it would attract capital and it would create all these wonderful jobs. Your study arrived at exactly the opposite conclusion. Yeah, uh, I mean, at Parkland and myself specifically, we like to do uh, empirical research, actually look at what happened. And, and so what we did is we looked at the four major oil sands companies, Suncor, CNRL, Imperial, and Synovus, and, and looked at their annual reports, which state that they saved uh, $4.3 billion uh, since 2019. Uh, and then um, we actually got some freedom of information uh, uh, requests that were submitted by the Alberta Federation of Labor. And what was really interesting in that is there was a briefing note from uh, public servants, economists in the Alberta Treasury branch, um, where they did research on corporate income taxes uh, right before the UCP took power, thinking that, okay, UCP are going to form government. What's the literature review on corporate income taxes and the effects on that? And what they found was that it's really hard to predict with accuracy what happens with a corporate income tax cut as far as job creation or uh, spurring on more economic activity. And furthermore, it's difficult to do with accuracy when you drop the corporate income tax so low that it's below uh, historical levels. So in Alberta, you know, we had a 10% corporate income tax from about 2006 to 2015 when the Notley government came in, they raised it to 12%. The UCP dropping it to 8% is 20% below the previous level. So we, we weren't able to look at Alberta specific data to figure out what's going to happen with this. And so then you're just left with economic theory, uh, which said, you know, there's going to be job creation, there's going to be a spur on of economy. And we really haven't seen that bear out in reality. Yeah, that uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. I've done I've interviewed I don't know how many experts on where the oil industry is going uh, internationally and and within Canada and how it you know twenty years ago the manufacturing sector and other sectors were adopting artificial intelligence and automation and remote sensing and big data and analytics. These are all rolled up in the rubric of, of digital technologies and digitalization. And the oil patch was uh, across the, uh, the world was slow to adopt it. But then about four or five years ago, it began, you began seeing it. And now you're seeing, you know, these job losses. And I'll give you the numbers. In 2013, late 2013, employment in oil and gas in Alberta peaked at 171,364 jobs. Today, it's 38,000, uh, sorry, uh, today it's 136,468 jobs, almost 40,000 jobs lost. 3,452 3, jobs lost after 2019 and the, and the, and that's the recovery after the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic uh, job losses. So the point here is, I guess, that giving a bunch of tax breaks to a, 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 a sector of the economy or an industry that was already shedding jobs 
because of you know technological reasons and and business model reasons and so on just seems so counterintuitive it just seems like it was bad strategy right from the get-go yeah i mean you're right uh automation and and specifically digitalization like advanced commuting like computing like you're talking about in 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 canada and alberta's oil industry has been gaining force for about a decade. It's really accelerated after the 2014 oil price crash and accelerated further, uh, according to the research that, that we're talking about, uh, during COVID. Um, companies really ramped up remote technologies and other sorts of, of advanced analytics, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning. And this isn't just a trend in Alberta or Canada. Uh, this is a global trend. You know, global consultancy Rise That Energy, which is based in the U.S., says that uh, in the next couple of decades, 20 percent of oil and gas jobs in the world are going to be lost because of digitalization and, and automation. So you mentioned the Ertz and Young study, which is Canada specific. We're looking at maybe 45,000 upstream jobs in production in oil sands uh, by 2040. Most of those are going to be in Alberta. You know, and, and so these are positions like uh, machinists, uh, service workers, heavy equipment operators, uh, the trades. And, and so, you know, when you look at those forecasts from uh, accounting firms or global consultancy energy firms, you really have to think, you know, first of all, giving a tax cut in that environment to these companies makes no sense. They're already uh, clearly stating where they're going as far as their business strategy. And then you think about the other side of that. Well, if that's where the industry is going, and it's been, in fact, going there for a decade in, in Alberta, um, what can the government do um, to create other employment in other economic sectors or support people who are losing employment in oil and gas? I want to give an example of what we talk about digitalization. It's kind of a, you know, it's, it's a, a lot of people won't under, understand what it means in practical terms. So I'll use an example that I that come from, came from my 2019 book, The New Alberta Advantage, Policy, Technology, and the Future of the Oil Sands. And, and a fellow that I interviewed uh, was a an electrician, and he, he uh, moved into this position where he was inspecting oil sands facilities. And when he started, uh, he was doing everything on paper and it would take them, they would maybe do one, maybe two buildings uh, in a day. So then they went to barcodes and, and iPads with, with digital scanners and all the data went up into the cloud. So he didn't have to fill out reports anymore. And he was doing, you know, four to eight buildings a day. So I asked him, did you lay off a bunch, were a bunch of inspectors laid off? And he said, well, of course they were. You know, we didn't need them anymore. And you can multiply that across, uh, you know, wells and and uh, those big ore haulers that have now been automated on and on and on all throughout the the, the operations, uh, the ability to collect data, analyze it and do it remotely is is just revolutionizing the, the industry. Yeah, I, I, that's the thing. I mean, it, it sounds like it might be a good thing for an everyday person, like digitalization, like everyone has a cell phone and, you know, all that stuff. But when we're talking about employment, uh, we're really talking about, uh, first of all, requiring possibly different workers if they don't have skills in, in advanced analytics uh, in, in that sort of uh, background. But we're also talking about uh, mass amounts of sensors on existing uh, oil and gas production facilities to produce that mass amount of data you're talking about. And, and they don't even need people to do that. Uh, and then that data is fed into what's called uh, a data lake and, and cloud computing and artificial intelligence, really powerful computers then analyze that data with some assistance from, from human um, workers, but for the most part, it's done by advanced computing systems. And then they figure out how to uh, produce oil and gas more efficiently. And that's why we've lost uh, a huge amount of oil and gas workers, just for the simple fact that uh, Alberta oil and gas companies can produce more oil and gas with less staff because of these computing systems. That's right, and that is a global trend. I've talked to economists in other countries who who see it happening in their in their own domestic oil and gas industries. Well, let's talk about report recommendations. You've got three. The first one is uh, targeted tax incentives uh, as instead of just cutting uh, corporate income tax. Yeah, that's just to say that obviously a blank check for corporations doesn't work. We've seen that with the oil and gas industry. This study alone is only looking at four companies. 
you know, we're not looking at the pipeline companies. We're not looking at the major, uh, you know, cell phone and, and mobile companies, which are also multi-billion dollar companies. And so uh, $4.3 billion given to just four oil sands companies is a low number when you look at all the major corporations in Alberta. So all we're saying is if tax breaks are part of the conversation on, on how to attract new investment or new employment opportunities in Alberta, that there needs to be strings attached. Like Albertans are giving our resources uh, to these companies to attract oil and gas, and we're expecting employment investment. And these companies are simply not doing that. They're, they're investing in automation and they're giving more money to their shareholders. Uh, there's a very good argument here that the actually we're not giving the resources to them we're allowing them to lease those resources. The, the Alberta government uh, holds the mineral rights in the oil sands and, 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 and auctions off leases that the oil sands can then go in and exploit the, the resource in return for royalties. And the, they get a, a fairly reasonable royalty rate, I think a lot of people would argue, but in return for that, the deal is supposed to be that Albertans get jobs and Albertans get, and then the government gets uh, royalty revenue and tax revenue that it can turn into uh, public services, you know, just hire nurses and doctors and teachers and, and what have you. Well, if the tax revenue is cut, the, royal, the royalty revenue is cut, the jobs are cut, then that deal, that that compact between you know the government and the owners of the resource, the Albertans and the companies, it seems to be falling apart. Yeah, there was this unspoken uh, rule in Alberta going back to you know Premier Lougheed, uh in the eighties that we wanted uh, to give companies access uh, to our resources, but we wanted these these royalties in return. And the royalties became even more generous when rules were changed more recently. And so one of the things I'm saying and recommendations is like, even when oil is high, in this case, the government royalties for Alberta defines high prices at $120 a barrel, which is extremely high. The public take is only 40%. We don't even give get half the money. And then you think about, um, if you ask an everyday Albert, what is a high oil price? they would probably say 80 or $90 a barrel. They wouldn't say 120, which doesn't happen that often. And so all I'm saying is, first of all, the public take should be at least half. And we should really think about, you know, when that threshold comes into place, because that's the issue right now is, yes, our government is going to have a huge sub surplus this year of possibly $13 billion. They could be taking in several billion dollars more and, and using that to either save for the future uh, or we're investing in our crumbling health and education systems. Well, that, the uh, changes to the royalty rates are it was your second recommendation. And the third is that the government of Canada should impose a temporary windfall profit tax. And, you know, you know on the one hand, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I go back and forth on this, but what's driving that argument is the fact that the, the returns to shareholders in the form of higher dividends and share buybacks, which then inflates the, 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 the price of the, of the stock, uh, are enormous. The, the, when, when prices are high, $80, $90, $100 a barrel, the oil sands companies now are literally lean cash generating machines. It's their, their, their uh, return on capital, you know, their pro it's 20, 30, 40%. They're making billions and billions of dollars of free cash flow every quarter. And instead of, you know, hiring people with it, they're laying off people and sending all of that money or almost all of it back to shareholders. And, 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 and I, so I see the argument for a windfall tax uh, even if it's uh, a temporary one. And I'm not sure that, you know, I mean, there are lots of forecasts that, that show that high oil prices are going to persist all through the 2020s because of underinvestment in supply. So we might be seeing this kind of profitability in the industry for the next eight or nine years, and Albertans are going to miss out on the boom. It, it's a huge deal. I, I think not only for Albertans, for all Canadians. Um, you know, on the other side of the ledger, we have massive climate adaptation costs uh, that, are, that are raking in like tens of billions of dollars a year. And when you think about a windfall profit tax, what we're talking about is a temporary tax when commodity prices are exceptionally high. 
And so in other uh, countries, uh, such as like Italy, Spain, now the EU, the entire European Union is looking at it for, uh, for energy prices. Uh, there are those countries, uh, in the case of EU, entire uh, regional zone of the world, are looking for looking at a windfall profit tax uh, in energy or utilities or even banking, where these companies, in the case, we'll talk specifically about the, the four major companies that produce 85% of the oil sands. You know, CNRL is returning half of its free cash flow to shareholders this year. Suncor has already paid off all of the debt that they took on during COVID. And they're, they're shelling out um, the year that the ECP gave uh, the massive corporate tax cut to these companies. Suncor gave $5 billion to its shareholders. And now with elevated energy prices, with reducing their debt, the fact that they're not investing in, in their infrastructure, they're not employing people, they're, they're returning billions more above $5 billion. Uh, and, and, and what is the public getting out of that? You know, when we talk about loss of employment in oil and gas, there's actually a knock on effect. We're actually talking about losing six jobs, not just one, because of indirect jobs and induced jobs from, uh, from workers spending money in the economy. So it's a huge deal. And if you think about the fact that uh, within, let's say, five years, we're going to have a shrinking global demand, that means we're going to have uh, our companies operating in a shrinking market and, th and they're going to continue to uh, automate away jobs. And so if you think about economies in Alberta, uh, like uh, Medicine Hat, like Cold Lake, like Fort McMurray, where a high percentage of their workers are working in oil and gas, the knock on effect, if you're losing six jobs for every one for those local regional economies is massive. And, and we don't have a plan for how to deal with that. What's gonna happen with the dislocation of those people and those families those entire communities. It's, it's incredibly concerning for the future of Alberta and rural Alberta specifically. Thank you. Well, Ian, I'm going to wrap up this conversation by also pointing out that at the same time, the, the, uh, the, the industry is shedding jobs. And at the same time, it's paying back enormous sums to shareholders. There are still for the oil sands, $31 billion of environmental liabilities tied to this, the 37 uh, oil sands uh, tailing spawns that that has not been posted with the government it, it should have been it hasn't been and there, then there are i don't know you know hundreds of thousands of inactive wells and scores of of orphan wells i mean there are so many issues with the the industry and and yet at the same time we're not addressing any of them and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to talk to you about this report is because we're sleepwalking through a, the, the opportunity to address these issues now and it's going to come back to bite Alberta. It's going to come back to bite Canada. And, you know, maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, and we're not going to be ready for it. We'll have passed up the opportunity. So thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Thanks, Mark. Great talking to you.